Welcome everybody. I, this is unbelievable. Yeah. Good morning, middle school. <laughs> you know, we were hopeful after going several years without a, a conference, we were hopeful to maybe get 75 people. Uh, and to have 165 here today is just unbelievable and wonderful. And thank you for all of you for coming. I, frankly, I only agreed to do the keynote when I thought there were going to be 30 of us. <laughs> so. So the, the conference theme, Walking on Sunshine, Enliven, Reawaken, and Celebrate Middle-Level Education, is really a testament to all of us coming back together after COVID and having a chance to kind of enjoy being back together again and revel in the work that we do together. And so when I thought about returns, I also thought about returning to our middle-level roots and middle-level philosophy. And you know, we have more in common than just teaching fifth through eighth graders. Uh, there's a need to go back and have a reminder about everything that works with these middle school kids and what middle school is really all about achieving with these kids. Some of us need a reminder. Some of us may need an introduction. But it's time for us all to return to the sunshine. Tammy and I bought a new house about a, a, a year ago, and it's in the woods, and we have these fabulous woods all around us, and yet those woods seem so dense. And you wonder sometimes in the summer, how would I walk through those woods? Because there's so much vegetation. Other than just stumbling through, how could I go? And we became aware that when the sun shines on certain parts of our property, that paths are uh, emerge. They're deer paths. Now, I captured this, and in the bright sunlight, you, you, you know, clearly you can kind of see the opening, but it's hard to see that path that comes through the grass there. And that path was hidden without the light. But with the light, you could see where the path was. Like I said, these are real pictures from our property, and the pictures just don't do it justice, the path that you can see. Here's another one. This is where the deer cross our driveway. And again, it's hard to know how to get through the forest unless you have a path. But when the sun shines on our property, you can see the deer path. And you could see where you could walk and, and not stumble. And for me, this is what that whole metaphor about thinking about our, our middle level route, uh, roots is all about. So we're gonna learn about our middle level founders. They will be our light. And the middle level philosophy and practices will be the path that we look through. So uh, if you want some resources, I'm going to share this now. Uh, go to studentlearning.guru and click on workshop resources. It will be a summary of what I talk about today and about a million resources related to today's talk uh, so that we can then really just focus on the story I'm going to share studentlearning.guru, and then workshop resources. So I want to take you on a true hero's journey. And that hero's journey includes mysterious, mythical creatures that we all know really well. And valiant heroes to work with those creatures every single day. And wise wizards who shine the light on the path on working with these mysterious creatures. But of course, it isn't a true hero's journey without dubious detractors and anti-villains that get in the way of our valiant heroes being successful. And I'll remind you that an anti-villain is not someone who went from being a villain to a good guy. It's actually kind of the opposite. An anti-hero is someone who thinks they're doing good deeds and think they're doing it for a good purpose, but they're wrong and they really mess it up. And so they end up doing bad things unintentionally. So let's get started. Once upon a time, long, long ago, probably longer ago than you think I'm gonna start this story, there was a vast forest. And throughout this whole forest, there were many, many creatures. And adults thought, you know, we should help these creatures become good adults and to join our community. And so they built schools and sent the creatures to school and there were both elementary schools and high schools. And the adults thought helping creatures become adults and community members was such a good idea 
that they required all young creatures to go to elementary school. And in the late 1800s, we had compulsory elementary education. High school was still voluntary. And because of that, our mysterious mythical creatures were among the creatures that were required to go to school. And yet we find them a true mystery because one minute they're fully on task and the next they're fooling around. <coughs> one minute they're really interested in class, the next they're really bored. <laughs> one minute they're all best buds, the next minute they're teasing and bullying each other. One minute they behave civilly, the next minute they're in trouble for misbehaving. These are our mysterious creatures. And every day, the valiant heroes went into school to tame the mysterious mythical creatures. But without a path, they ran into difficulty and challenges like this. Can you help me, Mrs. Martin? This wasn't covered in my education courses. And without a path, they often left our valiant heroes feeling much like this. I've been teaching for 10 years, but three of those were in middle school, so technically I've been teaching for like 28. Because middle school ages you seven years for every year time. Until one day, the wise wizards were really interested in these elementary schools. And they helped us realize that these kids were not the same as these kids, even though they were all in the same building. Who are, uh, so if these mythical creatures were different from other creatures, wise wizards would have to spend time thinking about who these mysterious and mythical creatures were. One of the interesting things is that our language contains no word for this level. You're either an infant, a child, an adolescent, or a adult. But the most critical stage of all is that period between childhood and adolescence. And we didn't have a term for it. We said early adolescence, late childhood, emerging adolescence. We created terms, tweeners. Don Arcorn created the word transcessive to give an identity to this special age group. And yet now that the child development specialists have worked on it and appreciated it, it's really pretty obvious that it is in fact the most critical developmental period of all, the greatest period of change. Infants grow as much physically, but infants don't grow socially and intellectually as young adolescents. So no other age level is of, has greater change accompanying it than does the period between the years 10 to 15. Fascinating age. And the age that, and this is a major belief of mine that uh, also is the reason I think middle school is so important. It is while they are in the seventh and eighth grade, they decide who they are, what they believe, what their standards are, what their values are, what they might aspire to be. And because of that, the wise wizards thought if schools that taught 10 to 14 year olds could be different in ways that matched who these mythical, mysterious creatures were, and they founded the junior high movement in the early 1900s. Now the irony is they do not mean junior high the way we think of it today. They mean junior high the way we think of middle school today that have all these practices geared towards who these kids are. And every day, valiant heroes taught in ways that were harmonious with the characteristics of our mysterious mythical creatures. And our mysterious creatures were happy. But no hero's journey is complete without challenges and detractors. So recall that in the same forest, there were also high schools. And every day, high school remained optional. Until one day, high schools thought it would be great for more students to come to high school. 
And because of that, they appropriated the junior high movement for recruitment and turned the practices around so that kids would be ready for high school. So day after day after day after day, for nearly five decades, the light on the path was dampened. And instead of 10 to 14 year olds getting to learn in ways that were harmonious with their characteristics, a different path was highlighted. Not one designed for our mythical creatures, instead designed to serve high schools. And because of that, our mythical creatures got to learn in ways that were like high schools taught, so that they would be prepared and would perhaps choose to attend. Notice this is why high school movement is an anti-villain. They thought they were doing a good thing for a good reason, but it wasn't really the best for these kids. So this went on until one day the wise wizards ventured back to the forest with a light to shine back on the path for our mysterious creatures. Although the establishment of middle schools is widely recognized as a grassroots movement with numerous leaders and advocates, including public school educators, five people are widely regarded as founders of the American Middle School. These men, William Alexander, Don Lycorn, John Lounsbury, Gordon Guards, and Conrad Tuffler are all widely respected curriculum experts who took up the cause of middle school education and provided leadership for the now decades-long effort to provide all young adolescents with the opportunity to attend schools based on their unique needs and interests. These founders have worked throughout their careers to advocate for effective middle schools and mentored their students and colleagues, many of which are now national leaders in middle-level education. So let me pause our story for a moment to acknowledge something that some of you may have noticed. Some of you will have noticed that most of our wise wizards seem to be white men. I would say that that's probably mostly because the time period that we're talking about here. But as the story progresses, you will be glad to know that more and more women wise wizards join the hero's journey. But even acknowledging that, some of you will still notice the lack of diversity. And our wise, even our wise wizards have acknowledged in video clips that I'm not, uh, haven't included in the keynote, both that the hero's journey is well suited to our mysterious mythical creatures of col color, but also how we weren't anywhere near as successful bringing it to their schools. And they regret that. So back to our story, we're lucky to have a time machine that helps us connect with these wise wizards, including several who have passed. Our time machine is the middle level legacy project that recognized that our wizards were aging and that we needed to capture their wisdom. It included a lot of interview, interviews and videotaping and the culmination was this book, The Legacy of Middle School Leaders in Their Words. But it also produced a whole series of videos about their work and their belief about the work and their reflections on where we are with this work. So what's nice about this is that it gives us the chance to see many of these wizards live and hear their own words, often in their own voice. And in fact, much of my keynote is intentionally made up of video clips from this project to help you connect with their wisdom directly. <coughs> So 60 years ago, our hero's journey was renewed. The journey that is our focus began in July 1963 when Dr. William Alexander, noted curriculum authority, delivered a speech at a junior high school conference held at Cornell University. In what proved to be a landmark address, Alexander proposed a new school in the middle with its own status in the K-12 vertical system of American education to replace the junior version of high school. Alexander's speech provided a catalyst and was considered to mark the start of the middle school movement. It has been, however, the motivation, determination, and commitment of the participants of this project, as well as countless other leaders and practitioners that have sustained the middle school movement. 
So I apologize, I know the volume is low, we have it turned up as much as we can. It is not a middle level educator's attempt to keep you quiet. <laughs> Just saying. So these wise wizards came with a strong mission. With a missionary purpose, encouraging middle school advocates to involve themselves in an effort to rest young adolescents from what Silverman called the junior high school wasteland. From the start, the middle school philosophy was driven by an ethical or moral commitment to respect and respond to the developmental needs of young adolescents. This commitment led to the belief that they deserved their own schools and designed in response to their unique needs and characteristics. And as you can imagine, this collection of wise wizards wrote about the work so that they could connect with more valiant heroes. In 1975, the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development Working Group on the Adolescent Learner published The Middle School We Need, written by Gatewood. In 1980, the National Middle School Association, under the leadership of John Swain, commissioned a writing group to articulate the shared ideals of their organization. And in 1982, the first edition of This We Believe, the official position statement of NMSA, was published. In 1985, the Middle Level Council of National Association of Secondary School Principals published an agenda for excellence in the middle level. In 1989, the Carnegie Corporation of New York issued Turning Point, preparing <coughs> American youth for the 21st century, a landmark report which recognized the need to strengthen the academic core of middle school and establish caring, supportive environments that value adolescents. This, we believe, has been revised and published in 1995, 2003, and 2010. In 2000, Carnegie Corporation issued Turning Points 2000, Educating Adolescents in the 21st Century by Tony Jackson and Gail Davis, an in-depth update of its 1989 report. How many of you have some of these books in your personal library? And at the core of this collection of wizardly books is the wisdom of many versions of This We Believe. And we'll return to this a little later. John Arnold proposed that in developing middle schools, four key questions need to be addressed in order. One, who? Who are these students we are trying to educate? What are their needs, interests, and abilities? This is the developmental question. Two, what? What do they need to know now and are likely to need to know in the future to meet their needs, interests, and abilities? This is the curriculum question. Three, how, what strategies and techniques shall we use to teach the content and skills that meet the student's needs, interests, and abilities? This is the methodology question. Four, how can we structure the school experience so that it best facilitates the methods and curriculum to meet the student's needs? This is the school organization question. So keep in mind that the magical formula is Developmental characteristics drive teaching and learning. Teaching and learning drive the school structure. So let's start with the who question. Who are these mythical, mysterious creatures? Well, at this mysterious stage of development, our mythical creatures go through not limited to middle level, uh, the interest in what they go through isn't limited to just middle level educators like us. UNICEF finds this stage so important in their work that they've written about the adolescent brain. They recognize that next to age zero to three, young adolescence is a time with the most rapid learning and brain development. And that uh, those changes and the resulting developmental characteristics are a period of both vulnerability and opportunity, but they're too important to ignore. And so what are those developmental characteristics? Well, kids go through enormous physical development. They undergo more changes than any other time than birth to two, and it's accelerated and uneven. The bones grow faster than their muscles. You hear about growing pains. Uh, you have kids, how many of you have kids who won't sit still in their chair? That's why. The, the bones are growing and it, it makes them restless. 
And puberty, they start releasing hormones. That happens with the girls on average a year or two ahead of the boys. And the brain starts developing executive function. Intellectual development, these kids tend to be curious and have a lot of different interests. And they're eager to learn about topics that they're interested in or that they find useful. And they favor active learning and learning with peers more than they do other kinds of learning and they're starting to develop abstract thought. In terms of moral development, they're developing their lifetime attitudes, beliefs, and values. They are trying to develop their own personal values, but those are usually connected to parents and key adults' values. And they are working on becoming idealistic and have a strong sense of fairness. How many of you here in your classrooms, that's not fair? And they're tra transitioning from a self-centered perspective to thinking and caring about others. In terms of psychological development, identity formation is happening and they're starting on their quest for independence. They seek their own sense of individuality and uniqueness, but they're also seeking peer approval. And they tend to be, get this, moody, restless, and demonstrate inconsistent behavior you may not have noticed. <laughs> in terms of social and emotional development, uh, that often lags behind their physical and intellectual development, which can cause problems in the classroom. And a strong need to belong to a group. Peer approval starts to outweigh the adult approval sought in elementary grades. They're happy to experiment with new behaviors. They're torn between trying to conform and be independent. And they start to feel those romantic and sexual feelings and they try to emulate the behaviors and, and feelings of uh, people they value, their peers and parents. So we've had a chance to examine our mythical creatures and who they are. So what do wise wizards tell us about what teaching and learning uh, practices are harmonious with these developmental characteristics? My emphasis or my, even my contribution to this middle level education movement. Number one, I have blocked and continue to advocate. Number one, this middle level education has to be, has to be designed in such a way that it responds to the unique characteristics, needs, and concerns of young people going through this critical stage in life. If it doesn't do that, it's not good for them. <coughs> At the same time, as Dr. Van Til so elegantly argued, we must be aware of what society expects of these young people. Nowadays, what society demands, test scores and all of that stuff, which is a disaster coming. <laughs> and at the same time, not ignore, but be fully sensitive to developments in the various disciplines of knowledge. Because if we, if we relate well to the kids, if we meet the expectations and demands of society, but do it with content that is incorrect, inaccurate, which a lot of it is, um, then again, we are not being true to the, the expectations of an educator. So it's gotta be a balanced, integrated inclusion of nature of the learner, nature of society, and the nature of knowledge. Three foundations of curriculum that William Van Til taught. So when you think about these three foundations, uh, the developmental characteristics of the SAGE group, what society expects of us, and the disciplines of knowledge, it's easy to uh, realize, or it's easy to forget that when middle school curriculum is critiqued, for not being rigorous, not being focused on uh, contents of knowledge because you're teaching differently. It's important to remember that two thirds of this formula is uh, what people expect of us and the disciplines of knowledge. I've also want to pause to recognize that we've gotten to see the Grand Wizards, John Lounsbury and Gordon Vars. And we're gonna hear the words of others and get to see some others. And some of these folks aren't with us anymore. So while we think about that, 
Some of you in this room, I know, were lucky enough to work with some of these people and others, uh, and others that we will still hear from. And I hope that hearing their words, seeing their faces, hearing their own voices brings you back to working with them and uh, uh, allows you to reflect on your time with them and the work that you've done and that they did. Some of you have only studied these wizards, their familiar names, and I hope you enjoy getting to see them and, and hear them and not just be familiar with their words on paper. And some of you, I'm looking at this table, have never heard of these people before because you're new in your career. And I hope that what you do is have an opportunity to listen to what they say and think about what wisdom you can bring with you to your own teaching tomorrow and further in the future. So let's return to the wizard's wisdom about how and what works with our mysterious creatures. Most of our participants express a positive view about innovations and instruction for young adolescents. Being noted that the middle school movement has been tremendously influential with regard to instruction. That is to say that middle school classrooms today, more than 30 or 40 years ago, involve much more hands-on engaging type activities, to some degree projects, and to some degree interdisciplinary or multi-subject units and activities. Similarly, Dota believes that teachers today are more likely to engage in collaborative teaching methods than they did in the 1960s. She stated that generally speaking, middle school classrooms today are livelier and more engaging in methods and in pedagogy than they were in the 1960s. Several participants commented that middle school teachers are more likely now to engage in hands-on activities, cooperative learning, flexible grouping, and experiential learning and that teachers are less dependent on textbooks than they have been in years past. And let's, uh, you wouldn't talk about middle school if you weren't also talking about various forms of integrative curriculum. Herb further supported the ideal of an integrated curriculum that involves young adolescents in making decisions about their learning. We have argued for a number of years with increasing evidence to support our position that the more a curriculum can be integrated, the better it is, because you involve students in learning activities that are more natural and more meaningful. Consequently, students tend to learn various skills and knowledge based in different disciplines that enable them to perform better academically by solving integrated learning problems. So Valiant Heroes have multiple definitions of what integrated curriculum is, and so it bears uh, uh, our time to take a little bit deeper dive. And it really just boils down to three things. Are there themes or not? Are there separate subject boundaries or not? Is it planned with kids or not? And this really isn't any kind of, of um, uh, integrated curriculum, but it's common practice for teachers, maybe in a teacher's lounge, to set up a, a sheet where they're posting what they're teaching in their subject at different times so that a different teacher could teach a similar topic at the same time. And those kinds of connections are good for kids. They add to the level of relevance between the two classes. This approach is called correlation. But of course, there's no themes, no students involved in planning, and strong separate subject barriers. And then comes multidisciplinary. So you've got a theme in the middle. So for example, the theme might be building amusement parks. Um, and uh, then the next question is, what do the subjects contribute to this? And it preserves strong subject area boundaries. The math teacher would teach the math stuff, social studies, the social studies stuff. And then once you've asked how they can contribute, you would say, what activities would you do? Now, very similar, but flipping two of these questions is interdisciplinary. And interdisciplinary has the theme in the middle. But instead of asking first, how do the disciplines contribute? It asks instead, what activities and concepts and key questions do we have to learn about to accomplish this theme? And then, once you've outlined those, you ask, how do the disciplines contribute? And the ironic thing is interdisciplinary has a much weaker subject area boundary, but a much stronger collection of subject matter that's included in the study. So I worked with a, a school for at-risk kids in Buffalo, New York, 
And when we were trying to teach teachers how to plan these thematic units, excuse me, <coughs> we started by showing them how uh, there were uh, several uh, theme parks in the area. And so it was a topic we knew was of high interest to kids. And we showed them how when they first said, how does math, science, and social studies contribute? They came up with very few ideas. But when we then brainstormed what would be the activities, key concepts, key questions that we'd have to learn, they brainstormed a great number of those and then saw many, many, many ways that their subject area could contribute. So ironically, the interdisciplinary approach with the softer subject area boundaries has the stronger subject matter. Note that both these multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary may or may not include student planning. The separate subject uh, curricular organization is inappropriate for young adolescent thinkers. Um, it's antithetical to where they are in a larger thinking uh, and developmental orientation. And I think that um, we have uh, an appropriate model, whether you want to go uh, somebody's particular brand of interdisciplinary work, um, even going back to Gordon Barr's use of core uh, from out of the uh, 50s, or whether you want to go uh, with gym advocates with um, integrated um, the, the sort of thing that we've seen lots of projects um, illustrated with that. Uh, probably the Watershed Project out of, out of Pennsylvania as much as anything is, is an exemplar. Um, regardless of whether you want to go with one of those, I think that, that the argument that um, the separate subject um, does not serve us well, um, I think that one is something that a lot of people don't don't argue with anymore. So in the middle level, we don't just do integrated curriculum because it's a cool thing to do with kids or it's good for kids, but we do it because when we look at the developmental characteristics of kids, the subject se uh, separate subject approach doesn't match what we know about their brain development. Note that when we say separate subjects don't serve us well, we mean the valued heroes at the middle level, not necessarily all age groups. So we just heard from Tom Dickinson, and he made a uh, quick reference to Jim Bean's approach to planning integrated curriculum. And, and this was one of the positive models that he gave. Jim Bean's book, From Rhetoric to Reality, is given credit for being a huge landmark in our story. Uh, it was originally pu published around 1990, I believe. It jarred educators into realizing that we hadn't been working much on the curriculum question and had been mostly working on uh, questions of structure and activities. Um, but what Jim's book did was it brought us both a practical model for teaching and learning in the middle level that is aligned to the characteristics, characteristics you can only say that word so many times before you're going to mess it up, <laughs> characteristics of young adolescents. It matches, it's a process that's used that includes expectations from society. It's a process that includes high quality subject matter, but it's also a, a curriculum approach that uses themes, does not have strong subject area boundaries, but with really good content, and is planned with students. The model started with asking students, what are your questions and concerns about yourself, and what are your questions and concerns about your world? What are two better questions to ask kids in this age group, given what they're going through? From those, we would identify themes that would include multiple questions from each side. And then we would prioritize those themes and we would start by planning a high priority theme with the kids. And we would then ask questions. What would we need to learn? Like with interdisciplinary, we start with what are the key questions, concepts that we would have to learn to address this theme and these questions. But then we would also ask, what is it that society is expecting of you? And what does that tell us about what we should include in this unit? And what about the subject areas? We're supposed to be learning math, science, social studies, and language arts and others. How do we include that? And that's what that planning process looked like. I would say in terms of influence, the teachers who were doing the work with the uh, democratic and integrated curriculum in the 1990s um, were, were influential 
um, in, in enormous ways. Um, if you think about what was happening in the 1990s at NMSA conventions, um, these teachers would um, go into a room to present, to talk about the units that they were doing or to talk about how they involve kids in planning and assessment and so on. Um, and, and you have to understand that there would be 500 people in those rooms to, to listen to these teachers talk about what they were doing. And I, I, I think they generated a, a new wave of excitement um, in the 1990s. So just a point of reference, you'll hear references several times today to NMSA, or the National Middle School Association. Uh, they have since become AMLE, the Association for Middle Level Education. So in your brain, you can think AMLE and NMSA interchangeably. Now the interesting thing about Jim Bean's comments now about those teachers in workshops is there are people in this room that helped lead those workshops at AMLE and also at Maine's own middle level conferences and workshops. So we've had a chance to kind of look at the first three questions. Let's think about the fourth, school structure. I think people have really come to expect uh, middle schools and, and to expect them to be of a certain, a certain form. I, I think it is true that it has become more standardized. I think uh, despite protests um, about, about the litany of characteristics that would make up a middle school, um, I, I think it, there generally is such a thing as a litany. I think when people talk about middle schools, they, what they're talking about is um, four-person teams, an exploratory program, an advisory program, a block time schedule, and so on and so forth. So it's important to note, we've had a chance, we've looked at all four questions now about, you know, who are these kids, what does that tell us about the teaching and learning, and what does that tell us about school organization. And we've had this national perspective, but it's important to know that Maine has its own collection of valiant heroes and wise wizards and that uh, uh, we're all in this together. Mammal has played a big role, but there's others too in Maine. So when you look at the 1980s, uh, Maine middle level education started to get a, a grounding in, the US, in uh, Maine, and that's when Mammal was first founded. Uh, it's also when there was the first summer institute for middle level education. In the 90s, the DOE established a middle level endorsement. How many of you got that endorsement? I was one of the first folks in the state to get that endorsement. And uh, more and more schools were adopting middle-level practices. And uh, Maine started making connection to NELMS, which is the New England League of Middle School, and AMLE, and uh, important position papers like This We Believe and Turning Points. In the 2000s, Maine had a middle-level commission formed for the Department of Education that was supposed to come forth with recommendations. But it's also when MLTI was launched. And you may think of MLTI as the laptop initiative, but remember, giving every single kid in seventh and eighth grade a laptop and to be the first state that did that was a huge middle level initiative. It's not just a technology initiative. So one of the most important institutions to middle level education in Maine is the Maine Summer Institute, the Maine Middle Level Summer Institute. It was founded by Ed Brzee, who at first we all thought was just a nice professor at the university, and then slowly grew to understand that nationally he's recognized as a wise wizard and has been one of the founders as well. Teams brought a project to work on for the week. They stayed in suites on the UM campus, and uh, they worked with consultants and experts to help solve their problems and, and learn from others. Through the 1980s and 90s and 2000s, and it even moved on to Thomas College for a couple of years after that. And anyone who worked at the Middle Level Institute in the, in the um, 80s and 90s and maybe into the 2000s would probably mostly remember Ed for his iconic mustache. <laughs> he would bring in numerous wise wizards from all over the country to work with our educators in Maine. And they included folks like Monty Selby and John Lounsbury, um, 
Mark Springer, Sue Thompson, Nancy Dota, John Swain, Sue Swain, and others. Uh, and this was a great opportunity for us because we had them for a week. And they stayed on campus. And we got to talk with them and visit with them. And we got to go to their sessions. In our own list of iconic, valiant heroes who worked every single year at the Middle Level Institute, Judy Enright, John Lynch, Kathy McAvoy, Wally Alexander, George Hanley, Jill Spencer, Gert Nesson, and others were part of this. And if you think back to the Middle Level Institute in the 90s, and you don't think it was that long ago, just look at these two pictures. <laughs> Do you recognize the young lady on the left? Yeah. Who is that? Gert. Gert. And do you recognize the young man on the right? That's me. And I want to know where the other half of me came from. <laughs> and if you're into technology, I want you to notice that a MacBook was the most portable computer there, and that my projector was an LCD panel with no back that you put on top of an overhead projector. That's crazy old. Well, you might even be wondering why I would be wearing a ratty old sweatshirt to do a keynote. And then I realized, well, I'm a middle level educator, of course. <laughs> but you may not be able to see the printing on here, but this was the swag from the 2005 uh, Middle Level Institute for the staff and consultants. You notice that we had the appropriate spelling for staff. <laughs> Now the really interesting thing that I discovered in preparing this keynote is not only is one of my favorite sweatshirts from the 2005 Middle Level Institute, but it's the institute that we planned entirely using the Jim Bean method. We did not come with a preset list of workshops. We started with everybody in the big room and we asked the questions, what are your questions and concerns about the world of middle level education and what are your questions and concerns of middle level as you as a middle level educator. And we built themes around those, those uh, questions and then the staff and consultants worked all night to plan out workshops that could help answer these questions. I gotta tell you that, that working on this keynote has been a personal nostalgic journey for me too. Uh, to be able to remember some of these really wonderful experiences that I hadn't thought about in so long. So let's move ahead to the 2000s and the main middle level commission. The culmination of their work, and unfortunately we had to wait quite a few years to actually have it published, was a document called Bright Futures. It was our own main, this we believe. And it's kind of fallen off of the DOE website. I was able to track down an electronic copy and I've loaded it onto studentlearning.guru and it's one of the resources that's available there. If you wanna see what it said our priorities were and what we were hoping to accomplish with middle level education. So what was the impact of all of this work, not just in Maine, but across the country, from the 1960s through the 2000s? Well, there's no question that young adolescents have benefited enormously from uh, the middle school movement. Um, I, I can tell you that um, even, even in in uh, the most mainstream middle schools where people haven't really pushed the big, you know, the edges of the, of the concept. Even in those schools, I think more, ed more teachers than ever are um, uh, more understanding and, and responsive to, to young adolescents. I think there's a much, in schools, a much uh, greater um, understanding of, of kids than ever before. So do we just have anecdotal evidence and personal experience? The good news is we also have research to back this up. The good news is that we now have a growing body of research to support empirically the implementation of middle school practices and structures. McEwen discussed in his interview and has found in his research that middle schools that more authentically follow the middle school concept have higher standardized test scores in reading and mathematics than do randomly selected middle schools. Other studies have found that middle schools that have high levels of implementation of programs and practices associated with the middle school concept have higher achievement scores than schools that have only partially implemented the middle school plan. 
McEwen stated. More middle school to middle school the higher the scores. Did you catch that? The more middle school, the middle school, the higher the scores. The more middle school, the middle school, the higher the scores. And because of this, we have evidence that these founders, these wise wizards, have shown us a light that exposes the path to reaching these mythical creatures. So you think this is a happy ending. And it would be if this was a fairy tale or a Disney movie. You know it would be true then. But this is a hero's journey, and there are anti-villains and dubious detractors waiting to interfere with any success our valiant heroes are having. Unfortunately, one of those dubious detractors is ourselves. C. Swain described the current status of implementing the middle school ideal. One of the challenges we're facing today is that there are still too many middle schools that too narrowly define themselves. They may have changed the school's name and grade configuration from junior high to middle school. They may have even started to implement some of the middle level organizational structures, such as teaming or block scheduling, but they have only begun the journey and have stalled out. They haven't implemented teaming or block scheduling to their fullest possibilities. They still talk about interdisciplinary units of study done periodically throughout the year rather than a more fully integrated curriculum on a daily basis. In too many places, the middle level concept has never been fully implemented with consistency over time. Too many states still do not prepare teachers or administrators specifically to teach this age group in the same way they require professional preparation for elementary and high school educators. Arnold believes that the schools have failed to address the first three questions adequately. And in fact, they have reversed the order of the questions. They've started with and been preoccupied by the organization question. Once the organization is set, that of course limits what kinds of methods and curriculum you can develop. And then you can only hope that the kids' needs will be Again, anti-villains. They thought they were doing good with a good reason, but weren't following the path, so they messed up. They were well-intentioned, but unintentionally counterproductive. You all can guess what the next detractor is. Perhaps the greatest contemporary impediment to curriculum innovation for young adolescents has been a proliferation of public policies and practices that compel schools and teachers to segment knowledge for the purpose of making teaching Explain that. High stakes tests tend to limit the curriculum, usually testing the skills in separate disciplines. Similarly, Sue Swain states that this segmenting mindset is forcing the development of a new definition of a highly qualified teacher for the middle level. It's having a negative impact on our movement towards integrated curriculum and teachers who are knowledgeable in two subject areas. And so our mysterious mythical creatures are starting to lose in different places some of these elements. Some of these practices that match their developmental characteristics, some of these in innovative instructional practices, and some of these organizations that help make all of this possible. It is time for a new set of valiant heroes. We need a new crop of folks who will fight off the work of the detractors and the anti-villains who will help remind all our valiant heroes where the light pointed and what the path was, who will take back up the task of working the magic formula, characteristics drive teaching and learning. Teaching and learning drive school organization. The good news is there's a new wizardly spell book for us to use. The successful uh, middle school is the newest version of this we believe, was published in 2020 co-authored by our own Penny Bishop, who just within the last year or so moved to Maine uh, to become the Dean of the University of Maine College of Education and Human Development, herself recognized nationally as a wise wizard. And we'll have opportunities to hear from her more today. And the moral of this story is, we will tame the mysterious mythical creatures if we can find a new generation of valiant heroes to follow the path. And my charge to you is rise up to become our new valiant heroes. Thank you.